We're in this series called Wisdom for Life, eh? Wisdom for Life, where we're going through the book of Proverbs to learn how we are supposed to live every single day. You know, we've been in this. This is our third week, I believe. I could be wrong. It's been a crazy, crazy last few weeks, but it's based off this scripture right here written by a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul, Romans 7. He says this, I don't really understand myself for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. That's a weird thing to say. That is a weird thing. To, but can't you identify? I know I can. Like, I'm thinking I, I know exactly what I want to do. And then the, the day is over and I look back and go, what happened? What happened to me? Um, and the book of, of Proverbs is filled with like the dualistic nature that we live in. I know what's right, but it's not about wisdom or it's not about knowledge. It's about wisdom. That's the kind of the point of this whole thing is wisdom is not just knowing right and wrong. Is how do I actually achieve it? How do I apply it to my life? That's a note that you can write down. Wisdom is not just knowing right and wrong. It's applying it to your life. Last week, we talked about laziness, about not being a sluggard. Hashtag, don't be a sluggard. Okay, just that's the whole thing. Go check it out. It was kind of fun. Uh, I know we're, this is a church filled with diligent people honest, hardworking, but we all have tendencies, right? Man, every single person got uncomfortable during last week's message, and that's fine. It's a good thing. That was last week. Um, And then next week, so important, so important, next week is all about pride and humility. All about pride. Let me tell you why it's a really important subject to me. I can't I can't necessarily prove it yet. It's it's my thesis. It's, It's my dissertation, if I were to ever write one, is that pride is the original sin. It's the original, it's the very first one. And I believe, I can't quite prove it yet. And I'm not gonna try to in the limited time I have with you right now, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So Lucifer, Satan, you know, he was up in heaven and, and Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So he was cast out right in the, in the creation for pride because of his pride. He lifted himself up. He received the praise of God and, and it was like, yeah, this is pretty good. He's a worship leader in heaven. And they were praising God. And he was like, I'll take some of that. And boom, like lightning, he got cast out. So I believe every single sin that we could ever commit has its foundation in some sort of pride. Can't, I'm, I'm still working on it. You know, I'm, I'm pastor in progress. I'm working on that. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm cool with letting you know about it, but I think it's going to be a really important message next week. Because we all could benefit in almost, no, I'll just say it, in every single way in life, if we can learn to be humble, God, God will bless you just, just simply for being humble. Okay, so this week, this week is the topic that everyone hates to love and loves to hate, money. Oh, Lord. Lord, I just pray right now that you would, you would guide me and bless <laughs> money. But more clearly, it's our relationship to it. That's really the, the foundation of the, all the money talks that ever happened in the body of Christ is really it's what our, what our relationship to the money really is, which can be described in at least two ways, greed and generosity. And so on theme with our series, we're going we're gonna to look at how Proverbs talks about it. There's the greedy and then there's the generous, there's the, the proud and the humble, there's the immoral and the pure. So we're going to, just like that, we're going to start with the bad news first. None of you are going to identify with this person, the greedy person, okay? None of you are going to, it's, it's the bad news, but none of you are. I already know this, okay? I know you, you're, you're not. But, you know, your neighbor, you know, someone else might identify with some of these statements, okay? So let's jump in. The greedy person in Proverbs, the greedy person in general doesn't see themselves as greedy, just practical. Just practical. I'm just being, I'm just being reasonable. I'm just being practical. Okay, I'm just, you know, it's, it makes a lot, it makes more sense. If I keep more, I'll have more. Like it's obvious, right? Like this is just math. God wants me to be good, right? So it's just logical. We don't see ourselves as greedy, just practical. Greed is very subtle is what I mean to say. It's very subtle. It likes to hide itself in reasoning and logic. But remember the whole idea of the series is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Listen, uh, it was just reminded to me by that wonderful series, The Chosen. I love that show. It's so good. But Judas reasoned to himself into betraying Jesus for some money, for some money. Uh, In in fact, I've been teaching this for a long time, but I'm glad the chosen brought it up. It was actually the one year's wages that were wasted on Jesus' feet that drove him to go strike a deal with the Pharisees. That's the event. 
that did it. Like he, he might have been a thief from the beginning, but that was the event that did it. If you notice that, like you'll see like the very next pericope, the very next story after that story happens, that's when he, he reasoned, this is not working. This is not rational. How can we build an army this way? He was being logical. He was being logical. He, it's just a crazy thing. It's just a crazy thing. Although we believe we would never do something like that. And I believe that about you too. I, I am a glass half full kind of guy. I believe that about you. We would never do that. We might be drifting that way and not realize it in our logic, in our reasoning. We wear ourselves out trying to save as much as possible and get as much as possible because we think that's what we're supposed to do. Listen to the wisdom from Proverbs 23. It says, don't wear yourself out by trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit because in the blink of an eye, wealth disappears. It will sprout wings and fly away like an eagle. Like that's some great imagery right there. That, it's just so weird. It's like you're you like save, save, save. And then it's like some wings. And then it's like, bye. Bye. Your wealth is gone now. It's just gone. It's so strange that that's how it's described. But we all know it's true. H haven't you ever had something happen to you? And it's like, that'll be $30,000. What? Your, your, your money just grew wings right then and there. And it flew away. The truth about money is that it can come and go very, very easily. And if anybody's reasonable, actually being reasonable, you know this is true. And it, it, it goes easier than it comes. <laughs> but that's the point. Money and the accumulation of wealth is very fleeting. It's very fleeting. And it almost seems random at times. Like, why do some people, it's just, but we wear ourselves out trying to get rich. It's funny. The Bible reminds us over and over again not to let the pursuit of money or what money gets us control our lives. Now that's the relationship with money we're talking about. Not having it or not having it, it's the relationship. In the gym, where is it? Again, like it's the only place I go. It's the only place I meet people anymore is the gym. So all my stories come from there. I'm working on it, okay? I'm working on it. I go to the gym so often, I don't have anything to show for it. It's kind of depressing. I'm getting through it though. I'm getting counseling. It's gonna be okay. I'm in the gym and I'm like the resident pastor. Like I'm running around, loud mouth. Everybody's like, everybody knows it's, can't, you know, can't hide it anymore. But I got this one guy in there, goes to another church, but he comes up to every time I'm there, he comes up to me and he's like, pastor, 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 what about this? What about that? So I'm like coaching him, pastoring him. And this, this, this week, this week, he doesn't know what I'm talking about this week. This week he comes up to me and says, Hey pastor, I got this dilemma. You know, I'm, I'm trying to pay off some debt. So I'm working overtime every Sunday. I'm making so much money on Sundays, but my wife really wants me to go to church with, with her and the family. Now, I could get overtime other days, but, and he said, tell me the truth, pastor. Should I go to church with my family or should I get the double time? You know, when you Google search something and it says I get, you get 280 million results in 0.3 seconds, I was like, go to church, bro. What are you thinking? Because it like, he was dragging it out a little bit. And then he said his wife wanted him there. I'm like, oh, dude closed case closed here you are sacrificing your family i told him this because we have that he doesn't go to my church i've got nothing to lose right <laughs> i'm like bro you're throwing your 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 kids they're a certain age you're throwing that away you can get money half a dozen different ways you make tons of money to begin with like wh what are you thinking man like of course and i like a couple scriptures but i was like dude go to church bro your family is asking for it. They want that. They need their, their husband and father more than they need double time on Sundays. Are you saying, but we wear ourselves out trying to get just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Parents, listen to me. Um, your kids don't care about the Range Rover. You do. They don't. They would rather have a little extra mom and dad than the, the newest whatever. And if you got that, I'm not against it. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. But sometimes we wear ourselves out for the house down the street, for the next newest model car. And, and if you got, you know, a lot of money, like power to you, but it's, are you wearing yourself out? Where's the line? And the line for you is different than the line for me. Okay, because I, you know, I, I took this calling and we have a certain amount of money. You you know, are in a business and you're an executive there. So the line is different. Know the line. Where's the line? Am I wearing myself out trying to get rich? 
and trying to have a next thing, but I'm actually sacrificing time with my family in the house of God. Like, that's one example. I want you to look for those yourself. Don't sacrifice, don't sacrifice your family. Don't sacrifice things that really matter for things that are fleeting. Okay, okay. The greedy person, the greedy person, very logical, but also turns a blind eye to the needs of others. Turns a blind eye to the needs of others. Listen, I'm not just talking about the homeless and panhandling. Just anybody, anywhere. Greed is so fixed on its own wants, needs, and desires that there's really no room for anything else outside of their own circle. There's no room because I'm fixed on it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being logical. I'm, I got to take care of me. And that's true. You do. But that crosses a line. And then we have to, uh, we have to appreciate that God wants us to live generously. He wants us to live generously. This is an irrefutable fact. We've got to do this. Listen to the wisdom of Proverbs. Um, Proverbs 21, 13. Those who shut their ears to the cries of the poor will be ignored in their own time of need. Uh Uh-oh, (laughs) that's not good. (gasps) So not only don't do it, don't do, don't live life that way, but you're actually gonna be penalized on this side of heaven for it is what he's saying. So not only is there going to be an eternal consequence, there will be an immediate consequence for that. And shut your ears to the cries of the poor. You will be ignored in your own time of need. There will come a day when you're in need, when you need something um, and and you can't get it on your own. Like there's, there's people that are wealthy and there's people who are not, but there's all, no matter who you are, there's going to come a day for you when you need something that you can't deliver on your own. And maybe money can't buy it. Maybe it's something different than that. Maybe it's expertise. Maybe it's support of some kind. If you shut your ears to the cries of the poor, you will be ignored in your own time of need. So it may not be financial. Maybe it's whatever. But the book of wisdom is telling us in no unclear terms, your ability to receive is directly related to your capacity to be generous. That's big. And that is like over and over and over again. We read that in many different places, Old and New Testament. It's just the sowing and reaping principle point blank, is your ability to be generous directly has a consequence on your ability to receive. Receive what? I'm doing okay financially. There's going to come a day where you will be in need. And I want you, church, to be ready for that by posturing yourself in a a generous place in life. Are you seeing this? Are you you seeing the wisdom? Um, So for me personally, um, because of our financial, and we're, we're, I don't mean to make it sound like you know, we're not well, t- the church takes care of us just fine. We're good. But like, we're not like Range Rover, you know, it's, it's just normal. So I decided long ago that no matter what, like something I was going to do to do this was I was uh, not going to require an honorarium for services performed outside the church. I just decided in myself, I want to be generous somehow, some way. I want to do something. And even though I can't, you know, gush money on people, um, I want to be able to do something, something different. And so I've, I've never, if, if people don't bring it up, I don't bring it up. Weddings, funerals, counseling, if they don't bring it up, I don't bring it up. And I never worry. But pastors, you know, for all of time have and can, and every right to like charge something for that, you know, like, oh, that'll be whatever. I don't bring it up. And if someone does bring it up, they're like, Hey pastor, you know, thanks for whatever. Thanks for this counseling session. Thanks for doing the funeral for us. Thanks for doing the, the whatever, you know, what do you, what, what, what do you do for that? My, my response, this is just personal to me. I'm not saying every pastor should do this. This is just a personal conviction. I would say this, I would say this. I have no financial requirement. If you feel like doing something, go for it, but I will never talk about it again, but I have no requirement for doing it. So that's my one way. It's not the only way, but it's one way that I try to not close my ears. So just, just recently, I just finished up with a couple Never came to this church before. There was a referral of a referral. Someone from here referred someone else. They needed premarital counseling. It was like a whole thing. We do premarital counseling pretty big. They would have them take a test. I meet with them several times and I didn't even know them. And I don't think, I I think I might've been the first pastor they ever talked to. And guess what? It never came up. Finances never came up and I'm happy as a client because guess what? They, They got blessed by that. And I was able to give in a context that, not everyone else can. So maybe it's not financial, but maybe it's expertise. If you close your ears to the cries of the poor, like they are not poor financially, 
they were poor spiritually. They needed someone to do that. And I'm not going to close my ears to that just because they don't have the money. And again, this is not like if, if some pastor takes money for a wedding, like they're not bad. That is normal, very normal. That is the standard issue. That's whatever. But for me, I just were like, I, I want to do it this way. Because first of all, I want to lead the way in generosity in my own church. I want to be able to preach and teach you what I'm doing, <laughs> what I'm actually living out in my own life, okay? So that was, that was just something we can do. And lots of people, by the way, have given me way more than I deserve for doing little things. And I don't shoo it away. I'm just like, I, I didn't need it. God is my witness. Like, I just like, thank you for that, but I would have done it for nothing. And that's just something that I do to not turn a blind eye. Are you getting that? I, w- I want you to think about what, is, what, is, what about you? You know, maybe finances is the easy number one way you can do it. But maybe there's other ways too, like your mechanic or your, you have a specialty. We've been blessed greatly recently. I mean, you feel how cold it is in here? Hallelujah. Like we've been blessed their expertise. And so what can you do to tip the scale and, and to be more generous and not, because we all drift. We all drift into greed. I was, I was kidding around with you. I know you're all very, very generous people. None of you are greedy in any way, right? But we all drift and we all have flesh that we're dealing with. There's the spirit man and the flesh that's always fighting each other. All right, number three, the greedy hoards treasures here on earth. Hoards, and that's an important word, hoards. Hoards, like, like I gotta get all this for myself. More is always better, right? If one is good, two is better. We love to go big F-16s and machine guns. And why do I have to pick between steak and sausage? Eat both. America, let's go. Like we are, we are taught to believe, we are ingrained to believe that if someone has a bigger house, they are smarter, better, more important, all of that stuff. Like we are conditioned to believe it's not an American thing either. This is like every culture, every nation kind of has a, has a belief like that, has a, cause it's a flesh issue. We're born with it. We have to fight it. Cause if someone has more, they're automatically better because more is better. More is better. We're made to believe that. And it's, uh, it's, it's like a little saying I came up with. It's not a good one, but it's something that we kind of believe. We don't know we believe. Those who hoard get the reward because they have the, they have the stuff. I did not put it on the screens because I don't want you to remember it. It's bad. <laughs> Those who hoard get the reward. Those who hoard get the reward. But um, no, no. <laughs> This is not out of uh, Proverbs exactly, but it's got the same author. Solomon wrote about this uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes. So Solomon wrote um, 29 or 30 of the Proverbs, and uh, he also wrote Ecclesiastes. So he's the teacher here, and he writes very specifically, um, Ecclesiastes 5.13, there is another serious problem I've seen under the sun. Hoarding riches harms the saver. Hoarding it's, it's the difference between saving and hoarding might be personal, but you know it when you see, you ever seen hoarders? You ever seen the show hoarders? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, look me in the eye and tell me that doesn't sound weird. Someone who saves that harms you. It's, it's, it does. It kind of sounds strange at first. Those who hoard riches, it it harms, hoarding riches harms the saver. Hoarding. Let's round out that word and listen to it from uh, James chapter five. Crazy guy. Love this guy right here. James five, one through three. Look here, you rich people weep and groan with anguish. This guy, he like does not give a rip about how, about your feelings. Listen up, rich people. (laughs) He talks different than I do, but it's okay. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away. Your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you were counting on, watch that. Wealth you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. There's the word again, hoarding. Hoarding. You can be wealthy and very generous at the same time. I cannot stress that enough. I mean, just read any of the gospels. He had wealthy people blessing him. Jesus had, and they were not, but there was a point, and even with the rich young ruler, there was a point where the, the hoarding of your riches can get in your way. 
Rich does not equal greedy. It doesn't. It just doesn't. But there is a point in our heart where we become closed off. And we need that. I mean, some people with way less money can be more hoarding than people with a lot more money that live more like with open hands. We're going to talk about that. In other words, if you're counting on your money to save you or serve you, you need to check your relationship with money. I have had many lessons in a very short period of time about that (laughs) with our own vehicles and air conditioning and, you know, savings accounts and whatever. If you're counting on money to save you, if you're counting on money to, to solve problems, then it's a, there's a chance that money has taken the place that God wanted in your life. That's the difference. That is the difference about our relationship with money. You've heard the statement, money is the root of all evil. Correction. Correction. So sorry. Excuse me. The apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the amount of money you have or save or spend. It's your relationship to it. How, how, how tied to your heart is that money? Is it, if I lose it, it's ah, is it, how stressful do you get when it sprouts wings? And if we're honest, most of us, we need to look at this, all of us, no matter what class you're in, no matter how much money you have, we need to recheck our relationship with money. It's a big deal. There is a way that our relationship with money is on the right track. There is a way to know. There is something people did, a standard that was met in ancient times before there was even a nation of Israel, before there was Ten Commandments. It was articulated in the law of Moses. Even Jesus spoke about it plainly and and spoke about it and said we should do it. It's tithing. It's tithing. We'll talk about it more in a minute. Some people love it and swear by it. Other people are like, it's the worst curse word you could ever use (laughs) in their presence. And some people are thinking right now, oh, here we go. Here we go. It was only a matter of time before he said that. Um, But I'm the former. You know, I'm the, I I, I live it, love it, swear by it. It's something that, and no matter who you are, no matter what class you're in, it's fair, it's equal. And it's something that God has ordained from all the way in the beginning, Cain and Abel. Much less Abraham brought one tenth of Melchizedek. I don't have time for all that. But it's like it's before the law and after. It's this huge principle, one tenth as a number. I believe, now again, this is a thesis of mine. I believe tithing is the test. It's like a, a benchmark standard test of our relationship to money as it relates to our faith in God. Because if you don't have any faith in God, then it, it, can't, it can't possibly be that. You'd have to have different benchmarks. But if we have faith in God, this is it. This is the benchmark. This is the standard. In Matthew 26, Jesus told a story about 10 virgins, about their, their, their commitment to be faithful, to be ready. There was 10 virgins, and it was like a test of their faithfulness. Uh, there was 10 commandments to test Israel's adherence to the law. There was 10 plagues to test Pharaoh's heart. 10%, which is the tithe, that word tithe means one-tenth. It's, it's a test for financially, you know, for God's house to test what? Our relationship with our money regardless of how much you have or don't. Yeah, I know. I know it's tough. I know. But more about that later. More about that later. Let's, talk, let's, let's switch gears. Let's talk about the good, the generous. Let's talk about what it looks like and means to be generous. Because I like to help people with that last topic more. I just want to talk to you about generosity. And I know you're going to relate to all of this, okay? It's going to be awesome. The generous. Y'all are so generous. You're going, to see all, you're going to see yourself all throughout these points, okay? Listen to this. Number one, the generous actively looks for ways to give like is like attentive about it, looks for people, organizations, ways to be generous, looks for ways to give. You see people like this. They're like, they're, they're like on the edge of their seat, ready to, ready to be generous, ready to give. That's what people of God are supposed to be like. That's what we're supposed to be like. Watch this. Proverbs eleven twenty four. give freely and, be, and become more wealthy. I mean, we're not even barely talking about that, but it's like, it's, it's like God can't help but bless someone who's generous. It's like he hasn't even, he, he could have just said, give freely, period. That's a complete sentence, <laughs> give freely. But it, it didn't stop there. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. 
Give freely. I want you, Lifeline Church, everybody listening on the sound of my voice, everybody listening online, just if you get anything else, like let's, let's live open. Let's give freely. Let's be open about this, knowing that our God meets our every need. Give, look for ways to give, good ways to give, good ways to give. Keeping those eyes open for God opportunities. God's going to open your eyes this week to God opportunities to be generous and put this message into effect. It's not a good message if you don't put it into effect in your life. It's not a good word unless I help you put it into effect in your life. Look for God opportunities to bless people, organizations that are doing good, that are, that are helpful, that are doing good. Look for those opportunities. Always remember this. This is something God has spoken to me very personally. I want to share it with you. I think it's good. God has millions, even billions of dollars all around us right now. All around us. Think about it. Think about it. Like in like a, in like a hundred yard radius, I mean, all the house worth, all the people's worth, everybody, like all the money, there's billions of dollars like in a radius, right? It's like all around us and it's, and it's moving back and forth all the time, all the time. It's sprouting wings and going back and forth. Learn to open the faith eyes that you have to know that God owns it all. And he's moving it around. Why wouldn't we just be open? Because if we can open ourselves to give, we open ourselves to be a part of God's supernatural transactions that are going on all the time. And we hear stories about it and we're like, why can't it be me? I want you to have your spiritual eyes open for every giving opportunity to open yourself up and have faith that God can bless you too. He wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. But we've got we've to be attentive. We've got to look for the spiritual side of things. Number two, this is like my main, this is the one I was like trying to get to the whole message. <laughs> the generous live with open hands. Open hands. It represents so much. Open hands represents so much. Proverbs eleven twenty eight. Trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. What happens to leaves in spring? They like sprout, they open, they like bloom, they're beautiful, they're lush, and they, they open like, like our hands are supposed to be. And I'm not talking about physical hands, I'm talking about our, our heart, our soul, to be open, to, to be open like this. What does it look like to trust your money? I, I, I see this picture of closed fist, tight, you know, stressed. We even use that word, I'm, oh, things are tight right now. Tight. Tight. That's a right word to use. I'm being tight. I, I do not believe I will be okay because I need to stress myself out to make sure things are, are going okay. It's tightness. It's tightness. It's stressed. Holding on so tight, you can feel your blood pressure rising. Amen. <laughs> but when you learn to, God has millions, even billions all around, all around, all the time. Why am I so worried? Why am I so stressed out? Why can't I just open, calm, relaxed, stress-free, open like leaves in spring? What you're actually learning to do when you live like this is just to trust God's provision for you. Trust him. You can do everything he asks of you, everything he asks of you, and you don't need to worry about a single thing. It starts in the home. Parents, we can teach our kids to live this way. Because kids naturally hold on, hold on to things. Oh man, money uh, money may leave your presence when when you live generous. So when you open your hands like this, money will leave it. When you live open-handed and when you learn to get, money's gonna leave. But there's something else that happens when you live open-handed too. It's allowed to flow freely, which is what God wants for every single one of his followers is to live like this. So it's allowed to leave. I'm allowed to trust God. I'm allowed to do what he calls me to do. And be, and, but God, money can also come in and go out. We can do this, but we, it takes faith. Because if we clinch down like this, then it's all up to us. And you have everything that you can provide for yourself. And if you're satisfied with that, I would just encourage you. There is more for you. There is better for you. When you live like this, yes, some may leave, but some will come too. And it'll be more of a supernatural life that you really want to live anyways. You want to live like this. The problem is, is we don't have enough faith to let money out of our lives. 
which means we don't have enough faith to let money into our lives. That was a big statement. <laughs> we don't have enough faith to let money leave our lives because we're living like this. So we don't have enough faith to let money into our lives. Money can flow freely. Finances, resource, provision of all kinds flows freely when we live like this. And this is the generous person, lives with open hands. And so again, to go back to that, that principle, uh, the most spelled out standard for giving being the tithe in the local house, it literally, I, I wrote it differently, how it would pry our, hand, our fingers open. No, I rewrote it. It allows us, tithing allows us to open our hands and say, oh, I'm gonna trust you with this amount. I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna begin to trust you in a new way. It allows us, it literally opens our fingers and allows us to trust God relative to our income, relative to our finance. And there's something that we like to do here at Lifeline. This is a little bizarre, a little radical. Something we like to do because we have so many new believers all the time coming to the church. Praise God, everybody's so amazing, it's wonderful. And most people who are brand new to faith are like, uh, 10%, uh, that's a lot, bro, you're crazy. So we, we were just like, got tired of, of hearing that. We're like, hey, you know what? God says we can trust him with this. And he says, put me to the test. So we, like, we came up with this, this thing called the 90-day challenge. It's on the seat back in front of you. And I just wanted to call some attention to it. We do something wild here where if you know that's something that you need to do and you've been wrestling with it, struggling, maybe it's the first time you're hearing about it, it's fine. You can register here and sign up for this. And it's like for 90 days, we'll just put it aside because we're not really in a position where we're like, hurry and give or else the building's going to close. Like, no, 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 no. We want to give you enough room to, to, to see God move in your life. 90 days, see God move in your life. And if he doesn't, this is the crazy part. We give it all back. <laughs> we give it all back. 90 days worth. We'll do, give it all back. And you get teachings from me personally. That I, sh I, I just really felt strongly about this, that we wanted to give people an opportunity to like, if you want to trust God, I know you do. You wouldn't be here if you didn't want to trust God. I believe that about every single person listening to me, right? You want to. You want to trust him with everything. But it, it's a struggle. So our job here at Lifeline is to help you, is to give you steps that you can take so you can see God's faithfulness. There's one. Here's one. And we, we take some of the risk out so that you can see God move and go, you know what? Maybe, maybe God really will provide for me. Maybe he really will take care of me. Maybe I really can do this. I hope, I hope that that helps. I hope that some of you will take that challenge today and, and just start it off. Or maybe just keep it with you. Put it in your Bible. Save it for later. But that's an offer that stands with us. We've been doing it a long, 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 long time. And we, have, we, we stand by that because we want you to see God's faithfulness in giving. And we want it to grow from there too. All right, last one. You ready for it? Last one. The generous stores up treasures in heaven. What does that mean? <laughs> I want to store up treasures in heaven, but what does it mean exactly? I want to store up treasures in heaven. The point of all of this, this whole message, this whole concept of generosity is to get us to open our eyes to the spiritual reality that you and I live in every single day, but our hearts are closed off to it. We don't see it because we get so wrapped up in our own lives and the, thing, the way things are going that we get trapped in taking care of our own needs. But Jesus said, I want you to store up treasures in heaven. I want you to open your eyes to the spiritual reality you live in every single day. Millions, even billions all around you. Doesn't God take care of the sparrow? Doesn't he clothe the lily? How much more do you matter to God than those? He wants to provide for you. It's up to us to open, just to open and to see. Because I, I, I believe, and I would argue that if we would just, if we could just see how God is moving things around all the time, we would be like, yeah, whatever. If we saw the spiritual reality we live in every day, it would be easy. And that's the thing is that we can't see it. It takes faith. It takes faith. And faith is the evidence of things unseen. It's written in Hebrews. And so I just want you to, I want you to read this with me with the next, uh, with your eyes open, your spiritual eyes open. Look at this, Matthew 6. Don't store up treasures on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust 
cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, the desires of your heart will be also. Jesus is trying to get our eyes off of earth and onto heaven. He wants us to see the spiritual reality that we live in every single day. It was constant with his disciples, constant. See things differently. Don't see them for just the natural state. We all, can, we all know that we live in a spiritual world. So why do we struggle to let go and open ourselves up to let God move in a spiritual way in our lives? Imagine what could be different in your life if you would just allow the supernatural to take place. If you would allow heaven to invade your life. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth thinking only of the natural, the carnal way things are. Store up your treasures in heaven and begin investing in heaven. Begin thinking about how heaven is a reality in your life today. That's the, that's the whole thing. That's the whole key. Open, open, open yourself. Open yourself up to what he wants to do. Jesus is trying to get your eyes off of earth and onto heaven where the real magic happens. It's not magic. It's more real than what we see here on earth, actually is what happens spiritually, is even more real. We can be deceived so easily looking at the natural state of things and we get spun out of control trying to figure everything out here on earth. When Jesus is, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, son, daughter, can you open your spiritual eyes, please? <laughs> There's so much more going on. When we put our trust in heaven and not earth, everything changes, our whole lives Listen, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, the first and best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. Did you know that wine, new and old wine, is referred to by Jesus as the covenant God made with us? Communion wine is meant to represent the blood that Jesus gave that established a new and better covenant of forgiveness and grace with us. So think about that. So let's look at that prophetic wisdom again, where he said, honor the Lord with your wealth and your vats will overflow with new covenant, new grace, new forgiveness. Like if you can let go of trying to do everything yourself and living for yourself and just, not just finances, everything, everything. Your, fi your finances, your relationships, your health, your vats will honor the Lord with the first and best of everything you are. And your vats, that which you store, will overflow with that new covenant, that new wine of grace, mercy, and forgiveness if we will open ourselves up to the spiritual reality. The major thing I want for every single person today is freedom to trust God. I know you want to, and I'm giving you permission and freedom to trust God in a new way today. Trust Him. Trust Him. But he's been, he's been giving me lashings for the last several weeks about finances, and I have just... I've been loving it. I needed it. I needed it. I needed the reminder that resources and, and all that junk is all around me all the time. All the time. I don't need to worry for a second. I will trust him. I will keep my eyes on heaven and he will meet every single one of my needs. And it's the same is true for you. It's not just me. It's for you. Millions, even billions all around you that come and go freely by God's hand. Don't be trapped by a mindset of lack. God loves you. He wants to provide for you. He wants you to trust him with your whole life. That's real wisdom. Trust him with your whole life. The real reason people are, are greedy is that they're stressed. They're scared. Don't be stressed. Don't be scared. God will provide for you. Trust him with your whole life. Money, relationship, health, all of it. He's in complete control and he can do anything. I want you to have that today. Uh, a new sense of trust with God. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I think that's a great place to pray. Lord, I ask for a new heart to be born in each one of us. <sighs> that we would just trust you. That we would depend on you, not ourselves. Lord, we will do everything you called us to do. We'll be responsible. We'll show up to work on time. We'll do everything we're supposed to do. But Lord, there's so much more that only you can do. And we just here and now open ourselves up to that. Open ourselves up to your provision, your care, your love, not just with finances, but with our relationships, God, where we're struggling, our health, where we're struggling, 
a, a, a sense of direction. We don't know where to go. God, you can take care of all of that if we would just let go of our control. So I, I kind of want to pray that way that we would let go of the controls of our life. And maybe there's someone in here that needs to let go of the complete controls of their life and give themselves to the saving power of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. If that's you, and you're ready to give your life to Jesus today and just say, you know what? I'm, I'm giving control. I've tried it my own way. It hasn't been working. I'm ready to give control to Jesus. If that's you today, heads down, eyes closed. If that's you, I just want to know who I'm praying for. Would you raise your hand with me and say, that's me. Pray with me. Pray with me that I would give my life to Jesus. That, amen. I see you. If there's anyone else, come on, this is your chance. That's wonderful. Love it. I see you too. Amen. God bless you. So good. So good. Church, as a family, can we pray this together? Just pray it right after me. If it's in your heart, pray it right after me. Say, Father God, I give you control. I give you my whole life. Forgive me of my sin. Make me pure. Open my eyes to see your reality. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to live. Amen.